Hey everybody, welcome back. Joe Costello back with you. Thank you so much for watching uh, throughout the day. And remember, we're just getting started. We've got two more days at Pink, Warren Johnson, John Kazi. It's been amazing and we're learning so much. And more importantly, we're taking our short block and running it through a process. Also, that thing is gonna end up with one of you guys out here at the end of it all. But a big part of it is the rotating assembly and balancing. And so our next topic, we're gonna dive into a video we're going to hear, learn a lot, and then we're going to come back with a question and answer session. And hopefully you've noticed that that is the flow of our format. We'll introduce a topic, we'll see some videos, we'll learn about it, and hopefully you guys will have some great questions on the other side. Uh, it has been tremendous. The feedback from around the country, around the world, is blowing our minds. We're super excited. And remember, you can still invite your friends, whether you go to engineperformanceexpo.com, copy and paste the link, put it in an email, put it on your Facebook page, do it. We want to get as many people in on this as is possible. It's going great. So let's get those questions going. Next video, engine balancing, up now. Andy Neal. I am the president of CWT Industries. Our mission today is to educate the community on balancing and proper techniques. We're going to give a few examples in this particular case of a heavy metal application and uh, we'll just lead you step by step through the process. What we're going to do here first, this is what we call the front end screen. Now we've already told the unit with these green cat eyes what the position of the counterweights and also the relative support of the crank. The key here is that these are the eyes of the system. Now I'm going to target 500 RPM. I'm not going to go ahead and start the unit. So it'll ramp up to speed, it'll stabilize, and when it does stabilize, it's going to come up and present itself to analyze mode. Now looking here, we're looking for about 80 cycles. And so once it's captured that, it'll shut down it's going to populate this area up here, which tells us the unbalance. The simplicity of this is, for instance, if I roll this around here to top dead center, normally we would try to drill, but you can see we're on the rod side. Now the problem with this is, is that we can't drill, so we have an option here to go to remove, and then we have a target here called HMV, that's heavy metal vector. What we have to do here is, we need to let the unit know where the counterweight edge is, and basically it's in alignment with the drill. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark that, and then I'm gonna go to the other side, and mark again. Now in doing so, we have laid out the diagram of the counterweight, and the machine is trying to work its way through. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna let it know that the counterweight width is 0.88, it says right now I am short by 197 grams, but I'm going to put it in auto split. And it again, once again, tries to make the challenge, but it's still short. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to move up to the next side diameter. And you can see now I'm 7.55 grams over. Now that has told me by going to the legend that we're using a inch and an eighth by 0.88 and three slugs and again, I'm within seven grams. Well, let's try this on the left side. Now, the left side has the same challenge. That challenge is I'm gonna mark the left, and then the right side. It, again, attempts to find remedy, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna help it out. I'm gonna to go to size, again, 0 0.88, and I'll go to inch and an eighth here. And now, in that particular case, on one slug, and there's a remedy, now it's populated this to say I'm within two grams. The key features of this is that this is like a Pac-Man game. So I can go ahead and basically play scenario after scenario without making a chip. Once I have a solution, then I can apply it to the crank and we're done with balancing. It's just that simple. In the art of balancing, the first thing we have to do is understand tolerances of balance. A lot of people are just picking numbers randomly throughout the air. Well, they should have never done that. In fact, what you want to do is use the ISO. Uh, the ISO is basically an international standard. In fact, it's under the heading of 21940. Now, what that really means is, and I'll give you an example here, we go up to our screen and we have an ISO calculator built in. 
Now this is a global machine, so it's gone all over the world. So we have it in, in certainly domestic, but imperial. But the first thing we'll do here is we'll use a pound reference. And you notice how everything is sitting with basically enunciation. So we drive you to the next question. We want to know the rotor weight. In other words, when we have a piston rod combination plus the crank, we want to know what that cumulative value is. Now cumulative value, in this case, we're just going to use 75 pounds, just as a quick reference. So what we would do is we would enter 75 pounds. And then I want to know what's called service speed. Well, in your case, in racing, we always knew the peak RPM. In other words, what is the maximum this thing's going to run? And there's always a variable. We got guys from 5,000 to 10,000. So in this particular case, I'll just split the example and say that I'm going to do 7,500. Now, from there, it's also going to ask the, the tolerance reference. And again, being a global machine, most of the stuff that we do here in the U.S. is ounce inch. So it immediately calculates out, and it tells us that our tolerance is going to be 0.189 uh, ounce inch. Now, you got to appreciate, if you go back a decade, uh, racing engines were 0.2, right? Well, this is what the OEM is doing now. You have to hit these tolerances. So what I'm going to do here now is I'm going to just say yes, and it embeds that tolerance into the program. But prior to running this, we have to build what we call a bob weight. Now the bob weight, these are moment match, and what that simply means is no matter where I am on diameter and where I rotate, the center axis of rotation and the moment center are identical. That's critical. In the old days, the bob weights were pretty uh, cavalier about their machining techniques and their tolerances, so they came up with indexing. And by indexing, you put this one here, there, here, and here, and the problem was, is that it would only repeat the error. Well, there is no error with moment match. So indexing is entertainment. So what we want to do, though, is we have to understand that bob weight consists of the product that we see here, the pistons, rods, everything. So we have a program over here, and it's called a bob weight unit. And from there, we can take a single unit. For instance, I'll start here with eight, and it's going to give me a, a basically a drop-down card. I'm going to take the rod in this particular case and just hang it. And now on the scale, it will stabilize. And we do a challenge to make sure everything's nice and even. And then we hit print. Now what it just did is it populated the big end of the rod. I will take this off, lay it down. And then once it stabilizes again, it now comes in and it will tell me that the little end of the rod is 172.2 grams and 4.66 on the big end. Now I'm going to drop this out of here to sort of shorten the story up. Now when I do this, you can see we've already populated all this. In fact, if I go back and review, I can see all of the rods and I can ask it for a tolerance. Now with racing, we want to be able to go ahead and take a unit and get it to its, what we call a mean tolerance for application. For instance, grandma's car, if I was plus or minus two grams, no worries. If you were going to sit there and talk about a street guy shoots a little nitrous every now, uh, we'll cut that down quite a bit, uh, save about 0.5. But in this particular case, I've got one, one tolerance of grams, and it's plus or minus, so it says it's all green. But if I set this back and I lowered my tolerance, let's just move it to 0.5, and then I sort again, and you can see now it highlights the units that are short. So as we see these different numbers, I can sort and mix and match but the software is what does all the mental gymnastics. The key here, simplicity, accuracy, and speed. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna drop this out and simply say that as we enter the units, for instance, I go to pistons, and again, I have all of the units. We also, for instance, I'll go back here to, well, let's talk about the bearings. In this case, it's 45.8, but we document it by the brand manufacturer. So we have a histogram. That histogram in other words, I can hold up to 2 million programs in this system. 2 million. Now, how do you get there quickly? You go back here, you close this out. So when you bring this up, we have what we call will call. So if I come in and I have all these programs in there, if I just punch in LS and you see it identified right away, and I'll go ahead and load the program. The key here is, once again, time. We want to be able to quickly recover setups, but we want to be deadly accurate in how we measure everything. So the piston and the rod, we lay them out on the table, and we have them, we typically mark them one through eight. As we build this bob weight card, we're gonna then turn around and put shim weights onto the unit that equals the bob weight card. Once again, I'll go back, 
This particular one is 1810, or each half would be 905. That 905 is per half, so that means the moment center line is the right dead center. We call it the principal center line or moment center line. Now, once we do that, we capture this by taking spacers that you see right here, and typically this unit here is 2200. And I'm just going to shoot over here real quick, rotate the crank, and drop this in so I know they're spaced properly. If you don't space the units properly, you will get invalid data. Most guys are pretty cavalier about how they mount the bob weights. They go through this indexing process because that's an old wives tale and it's based on basically loose tolerance manufacturing. We don't do that anymore. Everything is to the next level. At the end of the day, if your data is good here, you apply it to the crank here. Once we spin it, then we're going to populate this with actual good data that we can respond to. One of the things that's changed over time, and in fact, the Greek philosophers once said that the only constant in life is change. Well, we have government regulations now, we have insurance issues, we have personnel issues, but safety is the number one thing that we have to concentrate on. A lot of the filming that we're doing here on site, we're actually removing this safety guard. Now, in the old days, we had drive systems that we actually pulled down arms, held down on it. Your insurance guy is not going to like that anymore. Your OSHA guy is definitely going to penalize you for it. So the new techniques that are involved are based and, and motivated by, quite simply, the law. Now, in this particular case, this particular guard, if we go ahead and we launch this, I'm going to give it a target RPM of 500. I'm going to launch again. But now you see the operator is always positioned to the right of the machine away from the rotating mass. The idea here is if something goes stupid, you get to see the story, you get to tell the story, but you're not part of the story. The insurance companies are driving this totally in that direction. So we keep this away from anybody getting hurt. It's something that the industry is just going to have to accept because we do already have customers that are being penalized, that are being fined. And these option pieces here, we go back to our first machine and we can retro that onto the unit. Does this add a little aggravation to the process that we're used to? I get it. Bottom line though, out of that, we don't want anybody hurt. It's just that simple. All right, one of the key features of the CWT balancer is our construction techniques. In other words, we're the only 100% in-house manufacturer of balancers. Now that goes from electronics, it goes to base material to full finished product. But when we designed our machine, we designed it over time. Now what I mean by that is not that it took us time to build it, it means that we're studying how long it takes to get the process. So when you look at our machines, you can see, and we'll just pan through this in a minute, but we ergonomically set this up so that the operator's not going back and forth, back and forth, waiting steps. Now, in doing so, we want to be as efficient as we can, but at the same time, we never yield accuracy or tolerances. So, for instance, when I look at how we lay out our tables, I look at our screens, I go back to our base. This base right here is 4,300 pounds. If you go back and you see, we're the only people in the country that build a purpose-built drill for this application. This drill is totally built in-house. Now, it's the most powerful drill on the market. It uses an ER-40 collet system as opposed to an R-8. It actually has dual compression springs, so it actually stabilizes the drill. It is a variable speed so that we can sit there and have low speed, high torque, or high speed drilling. Just a simple control here so the operator can can creep into an, an event because when we talk about a crank, we've got a convex surface, and we have a lead point of a drill, and they're just pissed. Let's just be fair about it. Once we get through that, then it stabilizes and everything starts to work better. Let's go ahead and just shut this down. But then after we have done our analysis and found out what's wrong with the unit, if we have to have heavy metal, we put it over here on its own stand. So this unit will be able to move and transverse over. It's powerful. So that we're going to pre-drill and we're going to ream properly. Guys who are sitting and putting slugs in a slip fit and welding, incredibly bad idea. It's an unsafe idea. And the number one reason is the mass density of your Mallory, which is a trade name, it's really tungsten, and your base product, well, I don't care if it's a 4340 or 8600 series, 
The deal is the density of expansion and contraction requires proper press fit. So when we see technicians going and starting to do welds around there, if they'll follow that well and study it, they'll see a micro crack follow it. Some guys will tack it. What you should do is understand proper press fit. Now, for those of you that do this type of install in the radial, stop it. Just that simple, stop it. If that unit separates, it's gonna cause such chaos and damage, it's coming through the pan, it's gonna puke the pan, it's gonna throw oil everywhere, you're gonna cause an accident. Radial input is a no-no, just don't do it. Now, back to the base itself, one of the key factors of our base is that we basically isolate the energy by rotation from the base itself. In doing so, we get accurate reporting. Now, whenever you take electronics of this type of sensitivity and you put it on a weak base, you always have seismic activity coming up this way and you have energy that bounces this way and you get an impure signal. Now, is it minor? Yeah, but it's pollutant. It's just that simple, it's wrong. Quality always wins here. All right, lastly, the one thing that we've tried again is get back to the ergonomics. The operator, you can see, I can go from side to side to all this function, I'm doing it within six feet. I'm saving time. I'm keeping the operator focused. The end result is accuracy. And by the way, when we get done with this thing, you're supposed to kick out the back door with profit. Well, that's what we're all about. One last thing. Machinery is deaf, dumb, and iron. What separates CWT from everyone else is our application knowledge. I say this with tongue in cheek, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but we've probably forgotten more than what most people know. But we're willing to share everything. So our machine center, where we are in Atlanta, is the only dedicated, total in-house training facility. But we don't train just how to push buttons and run. We teach you the principles of balance. It's critical that when you leave our facility, you know what you're doing. You don't know how to push a button well, but you do understand the dynamics of what balancing is all about. Knowledge is power, and we're willing to pass that knowledge on to you. It's all free. Hey, thanks for joining us for a quick demo. I'm Ryan, I'm here at the Rottler factory in Kent, and behind me is the EM69 HP. This is our clockwork and porting machines. Uh, if you take a look in here, uh, we've got something unique set up here today to show some of the multi-axis, specifically four-axis machining capabilities that we can do. We have our adapter on here for a three-jaw chuck, which lets us put, as you'll see, a crankshaft or any cylindrical object you wanted in here. And over here we have our Rottler 4C software. It's what we've used to import a step model of a crank that has the features we want to machine onto it. Um, and just to give an example, we're here on, this is Cali's crankshaft. And the feature we're going to be doing today for this demo is they have, I believe it's called an arrow wing or basically just a profile on the counterweights. Those counterweights, we just want to profile it back uh, on the leading and trailing edges. And like I said, we made a model and we've imported into our software. And what that lets us do here is we have these relieved features and we put some toolpath on here. It's going to allow us to go down and kind of profile back the edges on here. Uh, now, programming this, just to talk a little bit about how easy it is to do inside Rottler and the 4C software, is for those who've never approached multi-axis or thought about doing you know, an index setup on a milling machine, <clears throat> it's really easy once, it's, re it's really easy, especially once we have a uh, a step file we can import that in it has our features we want and you can see I've already built this one out I'm gonna highlight this first profile that we're gonna do here and basically all we do is once we have that we know what we want to do and we can adjust that model we just select the edge on the model that where we want it to start cutting where we want it to end cut finish the cut on the depth and we basically set up uh, some step overs here so it doesn't cut the whole thing out at once so you can see here uh, on the visual and we can even simulate this, which is really nice. We can drag this along and see our, our tool in there, just stepping down, going over. I like to say this is all inside of our Rottler 4C. We're on our EM69 HP. We're gonna use the 5.8 ball nose end mill. Go ahead and profile these counterweights. 
And we'll go ahead and hit cycle start on this. Looks like say we'll let that run when it's finished up. We'll splice in some of the video from the internal machine and we'll catch back up at the end of this, show you the finished results. Yeah, thanks for thanks for tuning in and being with us today.
right, so we're back here at the EM69HP. We just finished up uh, machining that crankshaft in there and profiling those counterweights. And yeah, we got the model here, program's all done. We're gonna go ahead and open it up, take a look, see how it did. Welcome back, learning a lot, engine balancing, and now we are back on set with Randy Neal from CWT Industries and a legend himself, Mr. John Collies. And here we are now, this is, the engine is beginning to take shape, uh, moving into a vital, vital arena. Randy, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about it. One of the things that we do at CWT is sort of interesting. We've, we've been studying the efficiency of balancing and what we consider parasitic loss. John Callie here, it, it got my attention when he started talking about a design of redirecting some of the, the air, if you will, around the crank so that we could pull some of this, this air, or oil, excuse me, away from the journal. John has, has a good, rich history here of, of engine background. He got my attention, so actually what I'm gonna do here is let John explain this process. Well, the thing that uh, I was looking at is on the leading edge shapes, where the crank's turning, what's the best way to get the oil and air away from connecting rods? And so what we've done is the connecting rods are in the center, and the idea is as this is turning in the engine, that your leading edge takes the air and oil and directs it away from the connecting rods on both sides, and so you do that all down the crank. So. Do we have a definitive number of doing this? No, but the other choices are is a bull nose shape, which puts it back into the connecting rods. And this is the only way that I felt would work well to get it away and help the engine. To what extent? I don't have a direct number, but it's not the wrong direction. And so small items go a long ways. It fools you what that will do. And so that's where it came from. Well, you know, the interesting part is it work, seems to work in the application whether we're going to be a dry sump or wet sump. The uniqueness of it is, is that we're at a development point in, in all of our engine growth that we know how to make power, but we're now studying the parasitic losses. This is one of them right here. So the idea behind this is that we have to prep the crank properly. And as you've seen in the previous video, we now have a tool within the, the umbrella of machinery that can open up a new avenue of profit. When we look at this process here, uh, it, it starts to just whittle away at these losses that net positive horsepower. For instance, in Formula One, we're seeing opportunities there of 50% efficiency of their engines. Now on our side of the equation, we're probably 30 plus. So we keep whittling, we keep diving into this. But in doing this and balancing, what we also do is we prep this first, and then we wanna come back and balance. You can't do this in reverse order. So we want to get this machining part out, and then we want to go ahead and spin the crank, find out what the unbalance is, and put in the proper procedures of correction. Very, very interesting, and the uh, the idea of finding power in small doses in all of these different areas, the idea you're thinking about what's going on inside the crankcase with all the oil and air and pressure that's going on in there. Now, I know you have questions out there after the video, so please put them in the chat section, and we've got a couple of minutes for a little Q&A with these two gentlemen, but then we're actually gonna head over to the balancing machine and put Randy to work, which is gonna be great. Uh, here, here's one for you, uh, Lance is out there, uh, and this might be better later, I don't know if we'll have the opportunity, but keep it in mind. Uh, how are you supposed to space the bob weights is a question. Well, it's critical, actually. This is one of the, the old school applications where we're taking bob weights and putting them on the journals, and by not allowing the proper disbursement from journal to journal, we actually influence the machine to see load in one direction or other, which is false. 
it is critical that each bob weight is proportional to each other. In other words, if I'm two right, two left, I gotta tell you, you got junk for input. Now, if you, by, in technical terms, as a white paper discussion, they're dead center. What we do know is the algorithms that are set up in our machines are such that as long as we are proportionated and equal and repeatable, then we're gonna get good data. Excellent, excellent. Next question uh, coming in from John. How often does a balancer need to be calibrated? Old school. Let's go back to that. I mean, you have to appreciate very quickly, yeah, I started with Stuart Warner. I also migrated there to Hines. All these companies are great companies, but their technology is behind the curve. We, we moved everything forward. The only thing constant in life has changed. Technology is moving. This whole show, everything about this is about new technology. If you, if you did the things that you did 10 years ago, five years ago, or even a year ago, you're behind the curve. So when we come back and we talk about these things, you gotta have to understand we have algorithms, we have new techniques of visual displays, and so what we can do is accurately balance again. John, let's go back to, while we get some more questions, uh, I would love for you to tell me about the creative process of coming up with this. Is this something like you're having a scotch late at night pondering what's going on in the crankcase? But seriously, you've come up with a, with a concept. When, Take well, me through. When I started the crank company, uh, I knew I wanted to have something different that would be a positive item towards performance. So this was one of those thoughts. And the, the like this one, Randy did and if you see the outside, there's a little bump here because this wouldn't be what we consider a finished. You rough cut it and then you hand finish it so you don't feel any edges here because you want the air to hit, track on the side, keep close to this weight, and then on the back side of the counterweight, we want that absolutely square and it releases off. These are like so, aerodynamic right. principles right. Right. that are happening inside the engine at right. speed. That's correct. Right. See, and that's, uh, you know, I don't know if it's beyond most people, but this is what you have to do if you're going to compete in motorsports, which... You know, it's, it's, it's again, you're, you're looking at something that doesn't cost you anything. That's right. You know. But, but the key benefit here is that we're now going back and we're looking at things that we didn't look at years ago. We're actually studying the, these minute losses. you got to understand the engine builders have evolved to it. If you're a, a power assist type application, you can throw power at these things. Normally aspirated issues, we're looking at every little thing here. Whatever is parasitic, it's got to go. Very interesting. Uh, gentleman Tom out there uh, says he's got a CWT 5000, a little bit older, and he wants to know if there are updates for the machine available. Always, always. In other words, one of the things about CWT is that we move our technology constantly. We have a pretty good program, but we challenge it every day. We listen to the inputs of customers, and of course, we go with guys, everybody from Formula One to racing lawnmowers. So there are personalities, if you will, within the structure. We listen and we change. And by the way, anybody who's a loyal CWT customer that is bought first time, we update for free for life. Wow, there you go. And, and Mark, you said something a little earlier. He's a little confused. He's like, so wait, the machine never needs to be recalibrated? Well, let's go back. I, I guess I didn't answer that properly. Old technology is weak technology. The way we have our particular designs, we are able to, I'm going to say, we'll lose 1% of degradation over 20,000 on hours due to math. I'm going to lose 1% in probably about three years, and 1% is still within the scope of plus minus. It's just different technology. It's different hardware. This is not your father's Oldsmobile, guys. And, and th this is a theme that keeps coming up on our show, uh, the evolution of technology, even the way that we're doing the show, but that some may choose to not keep up to do things the way that they've always done in the past because it's working, but they're missing out on more horsepower, maybe even better efficiency, and uh, let's face it, the opportunity to make more money. Well, that's one of the reasons why you're in business, I believe. You know, <laughs> at the end of the day, I think the money does perpetuate your success, but you gotta understand, technology is moving, and if you're not following it, if you're not signing on to it, you're doing your, it's a self-inflicted wound. And you wanna be with a company like, for instance, we're constantly moving, but we share all this data. We have the only in-house dedicated curriculum training program at our facility. We welcome people to come in, but we are so free with our, let me back up and simply say our application knowledge here is free. Uh, it's, in, it's important to us that we move this forward. And the reason is that's how the industry's going. You think I'm gonna get behind this thing after what I just said? This thing is moving. 
Okay, here's a couple. Uh, let's see. Dave, how can overbalancing ever make any difference? I've never heard a reason why isn't imbalance imbalance. I need about 10 hours of answer that. <laughs> Good uh, question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a great question, in fact. But here's what I'm going to tell you shortly, because I will go back and do the next session. By the way, follow us to the next session. I'm going to answer a little bit of that. But you have to understand, I talk to people from all different uh, race teams and so forth, and there are applications that are using adjusted offsets. Now, a lot of it is theory-based, but not practical-based. So what we ask for every time we hear this, we say, just give us the data. You know, follow the math. If the math will validate it, then I'm going to support it. A lot of guys, they come back to me and say, well, I'm doing this. And I said, well, how do you qualify this? He says, well, I win races. That's not good enough. You know, and I'm not trying to demean that guy in any way, but we're going to always work on facts. We're going to stay with math. Well, exactly. More questions, send them in. We've got a couple of more minutes. Those of you watching on EnginePerformanceExpo.com, the balancing process, uh, rotating assembly, and everybody thinks, you know, intake, cylinder heads for power. You guys are focusing on this area to try to get that. What's more important, to build power or reduce the loss? Here's the, the, the final say on balancing. Balancing's mission statement does not make any power. What it does do, it unleashes power. You got to understand the stability of the process. In other words, the resonant frequency, the excitation. Just envision your tire going down the road and it bounces on the road. Well, that's unbalanced, right? Well, the same thing can happen here. If I excite that crankshaft and I go ahead and I start vibrating, let's just use that as an example. And I got a following device. Let's call it a roller lifter. As soon as I make that unstable, do you think the rest of that following valve train is going to perform? If it, if the rocker is fluttering or the lifter is fluttering, the push rod is fluttering, it's not performing at the valve tip, right? So the, the characteristics are changed by vibration. A lot of people have not put the emphasis into understanding how vibration has a working relationship with the mechanical exercise of the components, right? So you, you need to understand balancing is the stability and durability factor. It's not the power maker. It's the one that unleashes the power by the design of the engineer of product. Uh, let's see. Uh, Chase, and I think we just answered this, but Chase, if he's just signing on, is there an update on software for older CWT balancers? There is. And it's certainly available. If you're not the first tier or the first owner, of that, we do have a service charge for that. This is how we honor the guys who honor us. So, yeah, but we can update anything. Uh, like everything else, like with racing, how fast do you want to go? How much money do you have? <laughs> so... Plus. Not a lot, yeah. <laughs> but I get it. Ken out there in California, uh, loving the training and appreciating uh, what we are doing out there. And uh, just some, some commentary about uh, uh, what ISO compliant. Can you go into that a little bit? Sure, very quickly. ISO is the international standard, so I don't care if you're in Russia, China. Uh, and notice that's on the news lately. Yes. Uh, but the deal is, that I don't care where you are, this is the common math of correlation of balance. In other words, the ISO is global. So once we know what the mass weight is, we know what the uh, reference of what we call the uh, 2.5 for turbos, 6.3 for crankshafts, uh, and we know the RPM application. The ISO, which I'm going to demonstrate in the next session, by the way, I'm going to, I think this is important, we're going to be able to come back and show you that the guy that's sitting in Timbuktu can run the same spec as you, and you guys are joined by specification. Wow, fantastic. All right, a couple more rapid fire, and then we are actually going to move over to the balance machine and see exactly what we're talking about. Does the balance factor change based on engine layout? For example, uh, 90 degree versus 60 degree V8. The V8s are always going to stay within the home of 50%. When you get into the V6s, that's a whole new breed. And what they've found there is because of bank angle, split throw, so forth, there are characteristics that are developed, and so we have to have some offset. Now, a lot of that is actually controlled through a counterbalance system. In other words, a nuts or rotating device that's typically twice speed, or it is sequestered or dampered through the motor mount. In other words, the vibration is still there, but what happens is you don't get the seated pants unbalanced. So when you look at these different engines, every one of them has a personality, right? And once we know that personality, then we can establish a percentage to kind of try to find the sweet spot of operation. Uh, next one from Al. I didn't see a flex, pa flex plate or balancer on the crank in the demo video from earlier. Should they be installed while balancing? 
Okay, we're gonna go into that specifically, but let's understand if it's an internal unit, you wanna balance the assembly to its tolerance, then you wanna add the offending masses, in this case, the harmonic balancer or the flywheel. You correct them, not the crank. Remember, you've turned the crank into the balance arbor. You know, once you've got a tolerance, these guys are offending it, so you wanna repair them only. Uh, very cool. Any more questions? We got a minute or two to go, and then we're going to move over to the balancer and actually put Randy through the test. He's going to show us exactly what these machines are capable of. Uh, Mitchell just making some comments about uh, industry standards, and if you don't follow a standard, then all is lost. <laughs> Listen, think of a, a micrometer versus a C-clamp. What's the difference? The standard, all right? So if there is no standard, that's what the ISO is, by the way. The ISO gives you that, that benchmark of reference. And if you're in violation of that, that's guessing. Is there a benefit to balancing to, say, half of the ISO spec? No. Uh, let me say that quickly. There is entertainment on that side of it. Once you hit the spec, you got to understand that, that number is legit because of the application. Cranks don't spin on center. They literally re revolve. Very, very interesting. And uh, that'll do it for our questions. Certainly appreciate it. John, thank you very much for spending a little time with sure. us. And uh, I, I want to get more into that creative <laughs> session because you've come up with something very big here. Also working with uh, the folks at Pontiac back in the day. Thank you for that. So what we're going to do is we are going to move over to the balance machine. So we invite you to hang with us. And uh, Randy and I are going to go over and we're going to see this machine in action. So stay tuned. We'll be back seconds from now. What a day, what a day, what a day. But yeah, my brain, my brain is swollen. I've learned so much today. They told us, don't start cars. We are not going to listen.